You guys, I'm so excited for this class. First of all, hi everybody on Zoom. Hello everybody in person. Thank you so much for coming. Hello everybody. Are you guys excited? I'm super excited um, for our virtual audience. I'm so excited to announce we have a very special guest here in the office, um, Darlene Martinez. And um, she is titled Girl Flipper. It's her brand. Brand is everything, guys. So her brand is super cute. You guys can look her up on YouTube, every single social media platform. Girl Flipper is her thing. You can see right there her little logo. It's super, super adorable. Not just that, you guys, she has experience managing hundreds and hundreds of flip properties, right? And she actually has, you own 52 doors currently? Yes. So she owns 52 doors, which that means she owns 52 properties currently. 52 million properties. Who wants to get to that level? I do. Can you imagine that? How awesome. And most of them you took yourself, correct? Well, the majority of them actually, one of them is, is a, a complex, a motel that I turned into an apartment complex. Wow, so you had a motel that you transferred an apartment complex. Yes. I or gave you a massive amount of doors there. That's <laughs> awesome. And then it also has a mobile home space in the back. It has 24 spaces into the rear. And right now I have 16. That I'm running out. Come on up here. Do you know your network with all the properties? So, you know, that's a good question. You know, somebody special, her name Sophie, always has to put me on the, I don't know, on the spot with the network thing. Uh, and really, I'm working together with my account to build all that. I've really just been a machine yeah. for the last few years. Doing, 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 just doing, 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 doing. I'm just curious. Yeah. You guys can yeah. imagine how much money is And so, where I want to go is, you know, I started with the single families and just bought doors, just that traditional yeah. space. And then the more people that you talk to, the more that you really want it, the more that you really believe in yourself, what starts to happen is you start to attract, you know, those right opportunities because you're open to them. And that's really what happened. Somebody approached me with a motel and I was like, it's kind of crazy. Like what the heck? And then I started to really do a little bit more homework on what can I do? Talk to the city about really converting it to uh, really the living of apartments and people that didn't qualify for traditional apartments. And so I brought them in and now I partnered with the county of Riverside. Wow. So they are connecting me with people that are homeless that really just lost kind of their path. Yeah. And they give me a full background on them and I help them to rebuild their life. Wow. So, so it's really changed my life because I never thought, yeah, we talk about passive income and we talk about the beauty of that. But being able to give back to and to know that mm -hmm. I'm changing lives and to give them that opportunity is really a pretty big deal. That's awesome. And because it just fills the heart, right? Anything that fills the heart is just freaking phenomenal. And then the RV spaces to the rear are really what's cool is because I turn them into permanent mobile home spaces and they're all independently metered. So right now we're up to, I think, 16 out of 24 spaces. Wow. And we're going to continue to fill the heart that created on uh, seeing how we can really accept them. <laughs> sorry, so, everybody on Zoom for the camera. Chris, I'm sorry. You guys are sorry about that. But they pick up the good stuff. Yeah. This is like before, you know? Sorry about that. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you so much. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's, really, it's cool because I absolutely adore you. You're such a good friend of the family. Yes, right? yes, but, yes, yes. You actually came up to my first club and gave me advice and wanted to help you with me. I did. And I appreciate that. So yeah. thank you so yeah. much. Um, it's funny because you're at KW, we have a saying that money is good for the good it can do, right? Money is good for the good it can do, so I absolutely love that your culture and your heart and mind with everything yes. that we say our KW culture is, and even culture in general, regardless of where you are, where you're from, the broker you guys are a part of out there watching. It's just about culture and giving back, and she's a true example of, of opportunities to building wealth for yourself and opportunities for, for others. others. For others. Transitional housing that you're doing, right? Is it called transitional housing? Yeah, transitional housing yeah. is the perfect way. I mean, that is what we're doing, but really just kind of felt, I fell into it. Wow. So again, you know, what you think of, what you want, truly expands, right? And it happens. So when you start to have those conversations with yourself, like, nah, it can't be me, no, it can't happen, I don't have to lock it up money. I don't have this. I mean, it's all about just staying focused on really what you really want and why, and keeping your heart open, being a good person, and connecting with the right people, and they're going to make it happen. And so I'm proud of you for taking that step. I know, I was scared. <laughs> it is I was scared. scared. You're never going to feel ready. You're never going to feel. I was actually really scared to take that down. Yeah. And yeah. now look at this. You're in it. I'll and be done in, eight, in seven more weeks. That's a Facebook moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Woo! Hopefully everything goes well. 
Well, I'm excited to uh, teach the class, and then I have Robert here with me as well. He's going to talk about money. And so everyone, he is the money guy, and he's the one who gave me my first opportunity, and he's the one who gave me my first opportunity to manage a series of flips with um, their company. And I came from traditional real estate, and really he just saw that I was really good at what I did. So that's why I said, always oh, say, you never know who's watching and I think the way that he found me was that I was speaking on maybe a panel. I, I think that's how he found me. I kind of going back 10 years, right? Um, at the end of it all, you never know who's watching. And don't forget that being unique and special is your superpower. So what kind of superpower do you create for yourself so you stand out in every facet of your life and always remember to give to others? showing up you never know who's watching who you're going to run into take these opportunities you're probably going to come in and probably teach you class just like this that's what we encourage you guys to all you guys are going to teach you class step up here it's a free advertising for you guys so you never know who's going to watch and who's going to do it so i'm going to let them take it away i'm so honored and excited for this class and Thank you for being here on Zoom and in person you. and for yourselves. And thank, thank you, you a big shout out to Barbara Moody, our sponsor for lunch that's going to be serving us soon later on. Thank you. Once again, Barbara Moody with Snap and HD. Or Snap. It's a Snap because it's a show. It's on my mind. Why? No, she wants She to do it. Love you, Zoom. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll probably cut we out. We love you, YouTube channel. land. I'll probably okay. cut out this channel. Who be left? Woo! Look at you, Lord. I think I'm not about 20 minutes. Those are good questions. Oh, she just left. All right. He said when he said it. Before I used to go Transitioning over to the county of Riverside last year was a pretty big deal for me because I never thought, I always thought I had to be like minority women owned or I had to have some kind of certification. And really, no, they had to really send an inspector out, check out the space, and make sure that it was going to fit for what it is that was needed for that. So that's taken me out to the space of now that I'm almost to 30,000 per month of just passive income from the different doors that I have and the different opportunities that I have. And that's really just changed my life. Because separate of being able to not only receive the passive income, I'm doing something great for others and connecting with homeless in the city where I have my hotel. So it's been a really beautiful thing. So life is blessing you while you're blessing others. And you've created a life worth living by 28 grams residually, 340 money coming in. What was your passive income three years ago? 
So three years ago, my passive income was maybe twenty five hundred dollars a month. In wow. that, so she put it on the last three four years. In the last three four years, and I also want to make mention that I had about sixty thousand dollars worth of debt. So I had accumulated a lot of debt because I was going through a huge transition in my life. And I thought, well, I have to scrape credit, and I've had I've had all this credit available to me for 20 years. Why not use it when I really need it, right? And I accumulated a lot of it, really just trying to play catch up in my life and stay kind of just um, connected with the lifestyle, right? Which was a big mistake that I made because I thought, okay, let me just stay connected with the lifestyle. And then all that started to happen was the credit card debt started just accumulating, right? Next thing you know, I look and I'm like, I've never had this amount of debt. How is this even possible? But what that did is it really inspired me one day to dig down deep and say, Darlene, what are you going to do next? What's really going to happen here? How are you going to shift your life? And it started with number one, paying minimum payments on that debt, working extra hard, and going back to working seven days a week. There was no excuse, none. And that's when I started to really write down my goals and say, what is going to change my life and allow me to change others and live through my experiences and how can I guide them so that way they can change their life with their stuff. Because I feel like we've all had a stuck moment, right? And sometimes we think it's not going to happen to us because we did things right. But then life does happen to us. And it's about how you react to it when it does happen. So through great friends like Sophia, through really having a great tribe, and through really having an amazing mindset and really thinking about you know, a lot about for me personally, it was my grandmother who instilled a lot in my life and really connecting with her and saying, what do I need to do next? Connecting with Robert really about the passion that I had. And I had worked with Robert at that time probably for maybe five, six years at that point. Uh, and he was like, you know what to do. So it's time for you to do it. And I basically started digging and asking for help. And there were times that he would hang up the phone. He'd be like, you know what to do. Call me when you do it. And I get so upset with him because he was one of my best friends. I was like, how do you do this to right. <laughs> So yeah, so as a best friend, I was just like, how do you just like do this to somebody? Well, what he did was he really taught me tough, right? Which was, I knew what to do. I just kept asking for help and help versus just getting out there and doing it. And eventually I bought my first script and it was all through building my real estate commissions. My background is almost about 15 years in traditional real estate. That was my background. That's how I started. And through that journey, I started to find like, how do I create a new passion? Because I was closing over 80 transactions a year. So I was really burning myself out. I mean, it was really tough. I'm talking about maybe seven, eight years ago. We didn't have a lot of the social media and the internet. And we were still doing stuff. It's crazy how fast time changes, right? Because I'm talking about only eight years ago. But the reality is that through that experience and through working with Robert, what would you call I me mean, when I moved over to Anchor and I started working with you guys on disposing of the properties you guys were getting on auction? How, what, how would, there was a transition there, and Robert can kind of introduce that when he comes on and speaks to you guys. But he offered me an opportunity when I was speaking up on a, a panel, I believe. That's where he met me. And then they interviewed me for a position to be able to sell the properties that they were acquiring at the auction. So who would have ever thought, right? Who would have done that? So again, that's why I always say, always take note as to who's watching because I didn't know he was going to change my life at that moment. It was a great transition because I got to learn about flipping and investing in private money. But I never thought that that change or me taking that step with Robert and that company, Anchor Homes, would then fast forward change my life eight years later. Because of that experience that I got during that time, I ended up becoming girlfriend. And it was because of what I had built on my resume with Anchor Homes that inspired me to say, hey, I can do this by managing jobs with them and working with contractors and understanding budgeting. Because one thing about anchor loans, they were big on analytics. Everything was analytics. Everything was numbers. Everything was, I believe we had weekly meetings on just kind of like all we were disposing of and why was it taking too long? What were the days on the market? What was it costing? So it really taught me like in real estate, we tend to just make a commission and say, yay, we put in the bank and then we take vacation for three weeks, right? 
And I started realizing, what the heck? Like, no, you should not be doing that. You should be working, getting your money and seeing how can you create other lanes of income so that way you are always flowing, right? And that's really what Anchor Loan was talking. So <coughs> that is, that's that. Okay, can I jump in and say something? Yes, right. I'm so, I'll, uh, I'll add something to her because um, when she was first starting out with us, uh, one of the things that we were trying to teach her to get to like that executive level was to become more efficient. And, you know, when you hit a certain point, efficiency becomes key and you want everything to be processed. And so part of the process for us was like, okay, you run out, like, tell me about your day and she would go out and put her sign in. And she's like, okay, well, we got these open houses, so we're going to be putting out signs. We're going to be doing this. But like, okay, your time is too valuable to be putting out signs. So let's hire someone to go out and put those signs out for you so that you can spend your time doing other things. And just to think, like, I used to have a full time driver and the personal assistant, the executive assistant, just because what you're trying to do is figure out that what's your time is so valuable, what you're doing. You need to be spending your time to build that business. But when you get before you get to that point, right? There's stepping stones. You know, just step out and say, like, hey, I'm gonna get a driver, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do all that stuff. You know, from day one, you build up to that. And so this was part of like the story she would say where I, I like to tell her, hey, you need to do certain things, you know, and do this, and do the work, because you know, and I had this kind of shell shock when I sold my shares of Anchor was um was to transition back into the grind because you get used to just doing everything yourself, right? And you know, you get used to not doing everything yourself, but to like essentially delegating that work. And so when you start to do stuff, there's a little bit of a transition there where you know part of it's ego, part of it is just like you know, you forget how to do this stuff. And um, and that's what I wanted to make sure that she did is that you know you don't skip those steps because when you set up the processes, which is what she's in the process of doing now, you know, if you don't go through that yourself, you miss things. And so it's super important. You know, when you're building to go through those steps so, so that you, you know, you know what other people are doing. 100%. And for him to talk on that, it's so important. The one thing Sophia knows about me is that the grind is so important. I believe that you can't hold a shovel yourself one step away because we all need to hold that shovel at one point as we're building. It takes holding that shovel, it takes digging, it takes doing whatever you got to do for what it is that you want. That's a must, and there is no way around. Yes. One of the questions coming from the efficiency building decrease in cost while increasing efficiency and process improvement. Do you have those processes and best practices documented that we can actually uh, paint from you guys? So um, I will say that a lot of that is really custom to the situation and your company and how you're structured. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that when you're building processes, it is consistently changing, you know, and it changes as you grow. Right, and so one of the things that happens is that you have this process that you create that you think is a fantastic process until you start to get too busy, and then that process completely changes because just when you're bifurcating even one task between two people, is what do they handle? Who do, who do they handle? I remember when we were building Anchor, you know, we sit there and we went through the process of like, okay, how do we expand our, our like processing department, and is it going to be based like so someone has like let's say a dedicated processor per client. Is it as they come in? Do we dole it out? Because also on the backside of that is, you know, we had bonus structures for everyone and how did we bonus them? So if they get a, a client, they're all, you know, some person is obviously going to get better bonuses than others. So you're trying to mitigate that and be fair from, from the executive level so that you create a fair environment for your employees. And for us, one of the things that was more important um, was like the company morale, you know, and having that, that company culture was super important. Us. And so for me, that's what I would hire to the company culture versus skill because I figured we could train skill. And the way we were setting the company up was for sale. So we were, you know, looking at the processes that we can plug and play and bring in anyone else. So the, the concept for us was anyone should be able to do this task easily so that if something happens to that person, they can be replaced. Right. And that's the way you build value in your company. So we were looking at enterprise value versus just the task at hand. And having that bigger picture, which I think is key. So, so now when she's like setting up these processes, that's exactly what she's kind of looking for. Is is, is like I, one thing I learned is you know we've been active for 17 years. I've been in business now for 30 years. 
And, you know, it, and I sit there and I look at this, and the one thing that I wish someone would have told me earlier was, what's your exit? Like, how are you gonna get out of the business? How are you gonna retire? How are you gonna, like, like what, you're building all this stuff. You know, looking back at, like, Anchor, you know, we could have sold that company two or three times to the times that we had it. And, and not realizing, hey, that's the big hit, right? You're making money along the way, but like what well, I'm teaching my kids now is, okay, so you're doing this, for what reason? What's the purpose? Is the purpose for legacy? Because I'll tell you, you know, I always thought, hey, we're going to build this great company where we had it down to the kids. We even, like Jeff and I used to talk, I was like, yeah, our kids will run the company later on. Kids had zero interest. <laughs> in the they want to do something completely different, you know? And, you know, and so I look at this and I'm like, all right, you have to have some sort of plan in place, right? And and that's really a key part, I think, to, to building any type of company is, how can you exit? And one of the things that we noticed was that if you sat there and, you know, the more involved we were, you know, the more <clears> like we were, we were trapped into the company. So the company had less value the more we did. And so part of that efficiency structure is that you create a process for everything that comes to you so that you don't have to do it anymore. So you can be on vacation, you can be wherever else, and the company is going on. So if I get hit by a bus, the company would, would, would succeed and, and, and thrive. Yeah. And so all of those processes are key. And so I, I think that, you know, um, I remember having a conversation once with Jeff. We, we used to take all the managers to Hawaii every year. And um, and that was our, our corporate annual meeting was at the Brown Y Lab. And, and so we would sit there and um, we talked one time and we were trying to sit down and, and figure out like, okay, how do we how do we get out? And that's when, you know, putting the extra systems in place so that we can leave. We noticed so my last probably two years there were basically in the office. I turn on the TV, and as soon as somebody came in with a question, like, okay, so GM, you know, it's like, hey, we need to create a system for this mm -hmm. so that I never get that question again, right? And and that was the whole goal is to sit there, and just you know, you keep it moving forward so that you can do the higher level stuff. And I love the business development stuff, right? Like I love meeting with the clients, formulating the, the you know, underwriting, and, and Figuring out where the company was going to go, but you know the company would have less value if, if it depended on someone. And once they had that conversation about the exit, it started to derive different actions, right? So that's why no matter where you're at in your business, what is your exit, or what is next, or how you how are you going to improve your efficiency? What are you going to do different so you can do a few more transactions so you can attain different goals? I mean. The only way you're going to succeed in this business is by creating a plan on what is your exit. Why are you doing this? What's the reason that you're in this profession? You are in the most amazing profession that can take you in so many different lanes. And by still doing what you love, but then being able to exit when you want because you've created multiple uh, facets of income. It's working by choice. Yeah. And so let's save all the questions at the end. That way they can get to the presentation. So once you write down all your questions, then we'll get sidetracked from our topics. If you're in the back, I'm going to talk. It's a little more cool than I can do this. Yeah, and if you missed it, Darlene, in the last three years, four or five years, she she built a, a she has 54 doors now with a passive income of 28,000 a month. And she built it working really hard. And I'm so, so proud of her because she's one of the people that I've seen like go up, go down. And she's like, she's like Trump, but she goes to, from zero back to billionaire. Like, you know, hey, she don't stay down. You know? Hey, you don't stay down. Yeah, and she, she has a blueprint of a winner. Like, that's why he didn't go back to millionaire than billionaire. He only knows how to get billionaires. He went from broke to billionaire. 100%. That's a blueprint, you know. Hey, when you have the habits of a successful person, you should know how to do it faster now. You're like, okay, I'll just do it better this time. I'll refine a few things, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I heard a statement over there. I read it. She was on uh, Instagram. I started it. I'm going to post this and I thought it was really interesting. It's just when you think that everything is like at your darkest moment and you think you're buried in debt, just change your mindset because maybe you're not buried, maybe you just got planned. Oh, yeah, I love and it. You're ready to go. I've been planning a couple of times after blue again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did want to remind you, like, you guys really don't have an idea of like who's standing before us. Like, Robert has done 10,000 flips in his career, he's one of the people that is. One of the most successful people in the whole universe in this industry, and he's here in the flesh because of our relationship. <laughs> and then, <laughs> walk around. <laughs> and, 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 like, like to get him to show up here in person, you guys have no idea. 
Like this is such an honor. So please, I want the goal today is for you guys to I'm I'm arming you guys with resources and tools. That way, next time you're in front of a seller that has a distressed property or an inherited property, I, I'm giving you the team for you to tell the client, you know what? I'll, for, don't hire the that is an agent, hire me. I have I have a, I'll bring you a cash offer. Like, hire me, I have a team. Yeah, I have somebody that, I have a partner that will partner with me on this. Like I'm giving you my resources, you guys. Like this is my she, Darlene will you can refer her clients, you know, and she'll do them, or you can partner with her if you have the capital to do it. Like and this is and this is Robert. Like you guys, this is such a big honor to have them here. So thank you for showing up and please like listen to them and understand that now I, I just you just grew your network right now, like big time with some of the best in the game. Like knowing them is it's a big deal. Okay. Thank you. So you know, questions at the you. end, comments at the end. So we respect time. You're so, so writing down so we want you to get like the most possible out of this. We love questions. We're big nerds, you know, anything mm -hmm. that takes us deeper into mm -hmm. anything for a question we have heard, it's going to get us pretty, pretty excited. But what we're going to be delving into, and I'm sure you guys saw the flyer, it's the anatomy of the clip, right? Uh, it's going to be covering anatomy of the clip, it's going to be covering budgets, it's going to be covering a specific property that I just finished including this for long. So before when I presented this at one of our first broker events, I wasn't able to tell people what it was going to sell for because we were in a shifting market and a little bit of me was like him and I would have conversations every other day. So what's the activity on Sebastopol? So what's going on on Claremont? Like it was every other day, a couple times a week of just saying, but we officially saw her in the finish line and the family that bought her more excited. By the way, pronouns for my homes are she's and hers. Just so that way you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, but overall, they are, and it's because I pour so much passion into each one, and I love dressing them up for a hot date, as I always tell them. And they have to look hot, they have to look sexy, they have to be ready, right? Oh my, you, you think every detail, I invite you guys to go to one of her subjects. Every detail, and it's all about lifestyle, right? We want people to really, we want to make it easy for you guys to sell them, right? And to sell them and to really show them off. So with this site, we're going to be covering money, we're going to be covering budgets, we're going to be covering this property that I just recently closed restaurant on. By the way, we have three coming to the market next week. So we're covering from Palm Springs to, to Glendale to the city of Orange. We're going to have those three products coming out in the next weekend. I'll send them to Sophia so you guys have any clients that are looking in those areas. And then I think Robert has two or three coming in the next week. No, 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 no. Four more. So you might have four clips. They have seven clips ready in a week. Seven what what does that tell you? Well, we've been working on them for what about almost two, three months? Yeah. Working on them. So him and I were always like at the racetrack. It's him and I looking at each other side by side, and we're like, "Where are you at on your project? Where are you at?" And we're just kind of the And I get that. <laughs> you know, he did teach me systems and processes, and I follow them, and I only get better. Right? Uh, it's again a girl power kind of thing. You just do that. It's not intended. <laughs>10, 12,000 clips that I've been a part of. You know, we were trustee sale buyers, uh, did a lot of loans, you know, I don't know how many over a billion funded for loans. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done everything from new construction. I've had my contractor's license in two different states. Uh, I don't know, just pretty much everything revolving around flips. It's all I've done my entire life. I started when I was 17 years old, and so I literally have never had an actual job. This is just Wow. So we're going to go into the first one here. So this is kind of like, see it. This is We have cost one forty nine. It's hard to see from here. Want just open open you want you just want to open it around here. Yeah. 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 So we have Kirsten. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. 
like big boomers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a little, is that a little bit like, you can close it, it just shuts it yeah, yeah, but that's before it's on, like, now it's not, yes, 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 <laughs> it's adaptable, man. That's the best part. It is adaptable. That way it's a little bit bigger for you. So now you'll just scroll instead of tapping. Okay. You did this here. So we're talking about how we found the flip. And so if you want to use for reference, we're looking at 668 Sebastopol in the city of Claremont, which is where I recently had a girl flip her event. Um, pretty cool the fact that she's officially closed. But if you want to look her up, um, later on today, so you can see more photos, a little more details on her, feel free. Uh, how did I find the flip? Well, I found it through a friend who posted it on the MLS. And he called me and I actually met him at an event. He was from Orange County. And he said, hey, darling, he knew the city of Claremont. Guys, I'm located in the city of Claremont, California. And he said, hey, I know that you're out in Claremont, right? I have this property. Is it something you're interested in? And I, of course, ran the numbers, ran my analytics, and the numbers were there. So that's how I found it through Real Estate Network, and then they, they presented me the deal. As when you guys find anything, like Sophia said, you'll have my information. You can send it over. I will ask that you learn how to run numbers yourself. That's going to be the beauty of working with me, is that I won't only look at the deal and then try to analyze it. I'll teach you, and I'll say, hey, I need you to run the numbers and tell me what is this property worth once it's rehabbed. And then why do you feel that this is a deal? So I'm gonna ask you these important questions so you can get more familiar with how Girl Flipper operates. And then you'll just become that much more knowledgeable and start learning yourself on how you can extend. Uh, how do we find our flip projects? We connect with realtors in the area who want to buy. Can you I can, yeah, yeah that's perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, align ourselves with wholesaler. Uh, do you, does everybody know what a wholesaler is? No. No, okay. So wholesalers are actually a lot of times not, they are licensed in real estate, but what their main focus is, is just to find deals. They are literally scouring MLS, making connections with sellers, going direct to sellers, going direct to different lanes to see how they can find deals. And then they put those out to different agents. How, how would yeah. you describe so, wholesalers? So here's, I mean, there's, from an agent perspective, right? There's good and bad things about wholesalers, right? So the good part is that if you're looking for deals that you know you can buy some properties from them and essentially what they do is they take a property they try to tie it up for as low as they can and they're flipping the contract instead of flipping the property right. so all they're doing is they're taking this agreement that let's say they've got it for let's say four hundred thousand, and they're trying to find an investor that might be or 10 or 20 or 50 five hundred, whatever the spread is based on what they see the value to be once it's fixed up. So they look at what's called the ARV, which is the after repair value. And then after repair, like we're talking to investors over here who say ARV, ARV, a lot. And that's the entire basis of the business is, you know, buying gold and selling time. And so if you have this, uh, if, if they have, if they see value there, then what they're doing is they're basically going to say, okay, I can maybe get another investor to pay a little bit more than what I got that property in the contract for. And rather than flip the property themselves, they're just flipping that contract. And they do everything with the premium, right? Because they right. want to make sure they make their profit there by giving you the deal, which is the hardest part in our right. industry. Right? So now, some, yeah, and some some of the wholesalers are, I mean, I kind of call it a soft con a little bit because sometimes yeah. they, <laughs> they, they, right? I mean, what they're doing is they're inflating the yeah. after repair guys, right? Yeah. And then they deflate the cost of repairs, yeah. right? Because they're trying to make that spread. And so there's, there's, you can tell the first rule of our business is, right, is that. Everyone, and that's what Robert taught me. He said, I think more especially in my wholesalers, I love them. However, I have to say that I double, triple, quadruple check their numbers more than anybody. Because an agent I'm going to have dialogue with. And I'm going to say, hey, let's talk together. How can I help you get this deal and get it set up? What can I do to help you? I mean, I'm really acting as a colleague, but now I'm a full-time flipper, right? With wholesalers, I'm like, what are you not telling me? What do I need to know? What's wrong with this property? How much money are you making? 
And I really have to dig to layers that I wouldn't typically go to in a different direction because their mindset is what? Let me make my money and run to the next one, right? Get out. So that's the difference with um, wholesalers. And then obviously driving around neighborhoods. I'm big on driving for dollars and I love looking for that home that is in a beautiful neighborhood and it just stands out. Right? For dollars, driving for dollars. And I will a couple times a week, especially in Claremont, I'll go through because I work in Claremont, it's a city that I really love. And I'll go through and I'll kind of find those homes that just stand out. And it really works. You have a letter that's always pre-written and signed by you in an envelope in your car. It's always in a folder. And all you do is pull that out and you leave it on their front door. You never know, you may get a call that they're wanting to sell that house and we buy cash as is. You guys find that house for us, we incorporate a fee for you and make sure that you're getting paid for finding this that transaction. That's the priority in our business. So that's another very important thing that you can do. Uh, if you're a licensed agent, obviously we talked about searching on the MLS for fixer upper. And we talked about setting up the MLS where it actually spits out fixer right. uppers. And I don't know if you guys know that through the MLS, you can set up search engines where in different cities, if you put keywords, it'll actually send you a list, right, of those fixer uppers. And that's something you taught me, by the way. I, he taught me this and I went digging deeper into the MLS. I called them directly. And the MLS supported me in helping me set up that system. So feel free to call your MLS and have them show you how to find fixer uppers, handyman, any of those keywords, bring your hammer. Uh, all those keywords are going to bring out those homes that they need us, right? Because they're just going to sit on the market if they don't have the right region. So that's in regards to that. Anything you want to kind of shine in on? Yeah, I, I would just add from an agent perspective, right? If you're also looking to kind of expand your volume and things, you know, one of the things that, you know, right now, if you're out there and you're working with homeowners, whether it's a buyer or a seller, generally speaking, they buy one property and then you don't hear from them for five, 10, 15 years, they sell property, same scenario, right? With the thing about investors is that it's common. And that's, you know, when I first started, that's what attracted me to this side of the business was that, you know, I was kind of a lazy 17 year old, right? At the time I was a senior in high school, so I was, this was like a part time gig. And I and looked, lived in Hollywood. Yeah, well, no, then was I was, then, that was weird. Right? <laughs> and, and so, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, I like the volume of it because you can deal with one person who is doing X amount of transactions. And if you're in with them or you can add value to their operation, then you can create your own volume from that, right? And so that's kind of the thing that drew me towards it was it was much easier than being consumer facing. So it was more business to business, which made, which is a little more logical. And there's less emotion involved in buying a house when it's just numbers versus 100%. someone who's looking at, I don't like that piece, right? And, or I don't want to be that close to the street, or whatever the scenarios are that buyers, you know, typically might have as their their deal killers. Investors generally don't have that solution. Investors get so happy when we see confirms and yeah. we see too many bugs and we see the worse the better, right? Yeah, the worse the better. It's just we our faces and and I'll walk in with an agent and they'll say. But she's awful, and I don't know. She's beautiful. Look at her. Um, and again, it's because seeing what she could be, right? Seeing what the home could be is really the excitement for us. And nothing gets us more excited than seeing what property could be, right? right. And right. seeing that. And for him and I, we just think that way. We just walk in and we see things that just stand out. And so when agents get the listing back, because we love giving keys to a home that we've just finished. And if we could incorporate you into the deal where the money's there and there's enough, we want to give you that listing back. We want you to take pride in listing one of our homes. So that's so important and it ties to budget, right? If the price is there and we can help you get that listing back, we are going to do it because our priority, like he said, is relationship driven. And we love so much what we do. And the only reason why I'm where I'm at and why Robert is where he is is because of our network and our relationships and really being grateful for those relationships that we've built. So you guys are important. I'll add in one thing also, if you're working with investors, one of the key parts is that, you know, sometimes if you're just in general, you're talking to investors and she mentioned wholesalers that, you know, sometimes they go directly to homeowners. A lot of times, you know, they're not, they're looking with like blinders, right? And they're only looking to buy. And so, but a percentage of those are going to turn into loans for somebody listening for somebody else. And if you 
you're in, in, in communication with them, you know, sometimes that person can be you, right? And so that's really a, a secondary reason to look at it. But the whole key of the business is that if you're in the real estate business, that you look at the business from a grander scale and, and not necessarily that, hey, you've got to be, you know, Trump, right? But you can be just whoever and just look at the different ways that, that the transactions can happen, right? So if you look at a fixer offer that you're looking more for the opportunity and not just, hey, I want that listing. Because there's a lot of sellers that we've met with where they just plain and simple do not want it on the market. They don't want it on the market. On the, on the and especially with probates, and I think we're going to talk about that, you know, is very key because a lot of what happens with the older generations is that their kids grow up, they're now in the home by themselves, they become <clears> kind of a hoarder situation, and the house from the outside, I can't tell you how many times you drive by it, it looks pretty good. And you get inside, and the inside bad. And so, you know, from a saving face kind of with their neighbors and their friends, they don't want the house on the market. They don't want to see how the parents are living, especially when you know, they want to kind of preserve that thought of their parents. High end emotion. Yeah, high end emotion. I mean, we. I, yeah. I have, I have one right now that I'm buying that it was here. It was listed coming soon for 450. The it was a, a inherited situation. Brother and sister were fighting. Sister had full authority to sell it and said basically, like, give me something you can close in five days, and they can have it for 350. And they already had through an agent already had offers at their asking price before they even shown the house to the rally. To begin with the 350. But she was so fed up with her brother at 450. At 450, she's like, not worth it. The I'm not close in five days. I just want to be done. And it's like, okay. They know they're leaving money on the table many times. Yeah. You know, I had another Very scenario nice. where they walked us through and, and I had forgotten the scenario because um I got a call for like a month ahead. And by the time the appointment rolled around, you know, I just showed up to see the house. And I show up. And I, what I forgot is that the daughter said, hey, my, you know, this wasn't a probate, but, but my mom's paranoid. She's got an issue with paranoia. And so just be prepared when you come. It's going to be you and one other investor. And then whoever is the best is going to get the deal. But we bought it. But it was, it was, um, <laughs> it was, yeah, we bought it. But, but it was, it was what happens. I, I, I walk up, knock on the door. I'm like, hey, I'm here to see the house. And she says, uh, she's like, okay, can you stand back from the door? I'm like, sure. All right, I mean, I get it. People are crazy. <laughs> and so I stand back and she's like, okay, uh, she's like, what's your name? And I told my name, Rob Fergusso. And uh, she's like, do you have your ID? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, can I see it? And she's like, sure. Looks at it, then holds it like this. Holds it like this, stands back, takes a picture of me holding my ID. And she's like, okay, walk in front of me. <laughs> I'm like, remember, paranoia, and now I got it. Yeah, and, that's, and, and, and the daughter is already, look, look, if we have an open house here, she's going to go crazy. Yeah. She can't handle that. Mm -hmm. And we know the house is worth this much, we'll sell it to you for this much. And as he's saying this, what I want you guys to know is again, with Sophia knowing that with the extensive real estate background that I have, and that's why Robert, him and I go on a lot of these together, right? Is because that story, you guys never know when you're going to find yourself in a scenario where they need you. They need you to think different. They need you to be different. What is different? Different is your superpower, right? So always remember, be different. Have different ways to help a seller because it is, isn't always going to be, I want to net the most. It isn't always going to be, I want um, this perfect scenario. It's going to be a lot of times those people that really need buyers like us to, to step away and say, I don't see any of this. All I see is how can I help you help your client? So at the end, they're good and we're very transparent and we can see this home forward and then they can move on their journey without any judgment. Because I feel like a lot of our sellers feel like we're gonna judge or agents are gonna judge because of the condition of the home. And I have to touch on this before we move on to Sebastopol. Um, a little bit deeper on what I saw it and everything is that directly in front of this house, if you guys are ever in the area, there is a home with Christmas lights. In what month are we in? I mean, Christmas is in here. Those lights have been up since last year. Okay. Um, two years. Two years. <laughs> and there's a basketball court, a full on basketball court on their front lawn. 
Okay, this is the home. Talk about obsolescence, okay? My home is, is gorgeous because that's what I do. I create gorgeous homes, right? And she's beautiful. And then she's staring across at the guy she's not going to date because that house across the street is just not working for her, right? But what ended up happening was something pretty extreme in a shifting market. I thought that home, Sophia, was going to make no big deal. I thought it's not going to be a big deal. My home is gorgeous. Like, who wouldn't want to buy this home in Crown? Well, probably 80% of the buyers didn't even want to stay more than five minutes because of the home directly in front of me. So she lasted an extra month on the market because my homes usually sell 10 to 12 days. About, and in the shifting market, we're probably at about what, 20 days, maybe 25 days on the market with our properties. This home ended up going into escrow and, and it ended up going in 40 days because some people would just drive by and see this house in front. Did I know that even with my experience? I thought, who cares about the ugly house you have there? Well, the crazy story is this. Mom passed away out of that house in front. What's the first thing you think I do when I get a home that I'm going to fix up? Is I go and I door knock, right? And by the way, I empower you guys to do that. You can call and ask me, darling, do you have any deals that you're buying right now? Yes. This is where Robert and I are buying. Okay, great. Feel free to go door knock at me. Go and door knock and see if you can find me another home that needs me. Because my son, Jacob, door knocked the homes in that community and found three homes that were really bad, including the one directly in front of me. And guess who I met with last week? to buy their house because they want to sell as is and the home is severely bad is that home directly in front of me. So they are reviewing my offer right now and tomorrow they're going to make a decision because they are meeting with several investors. But I'm telling you, high end emotion didn't want to talk to me and then they said this, after seeing what you did to that house, we would be wrong not to give you the opportunity to do something with our home. Our parents would be so proud. So where I want to go is I want to touch on that, you guys. Door knock, look for those ugly houses. People do need you. And there's not, and again, because they're ashamed, because they feel paranoia, because they're going through health problems, because maybe mom just passed away. You just don't know the story. And how are you going to know if you don't go out and reach out for those opportunities? Because you're doing something good for them. And Darlene gets passive income thirty thousand a month. That buys this one. She's not too good to go door door knock. Some of you think you are. <laughs> no. So you're like, I never go door knocking, and I'm like, uh, hello. I do require no. cool sneakers, <laughs> and they have to have a cool insole. Um, that's the only requirement for me. Yeah, that one. Cool little insoles, you know. I yeah. pull, I pull insoles. I'm a little bit bougie when I come to door knocking, but it's only with shoes. I still <laughs> <laughs> I put on Nike Airs. I put on anything, and I just get out there. So please, you guys, put in the work. Put in the work. Every time you say I'm too good for that or I'm too this, one thing you know, Robert, with me, and as long as we've been in business together, is you can ask me to do anything out of the industry in the field, wherever we're at, and I got it. I mean, we've picked up dog poop. We've moved trash cans. We've had to figure out why grass is being turned by, by rodents. And, and we're, we're out there in our, like, Clothes and we're just like, all right, let's figure this out. And your and, and your Porsche. And our Porsche, your Porsche. My Porsche, <laughs> Porsche and his Porsche. And we're like, hey, yeah, this is us bringing these trash cans. <laughs> so, if you ever handle an open house for us, so we have some oh, yeah. calls for very like, important. Is, very is, uh, important. You know, you go through and I, I treat it very much like a store. And so, like retail stores, there's nobody, you don't walk in and somebody's sitting down, right? You have a greeter that's standing, you stand the whole time. You know, I mean, I've, I've walked into open houses where the agent's sitting there having a lot of like, okay, go ahead, it's all that so stuff. I, you know, <laughs> my, my <laughs> sit on the couch, exactly right. right. So, watching the football game, most of our <laughs> houses, you know, like I know that so most sad. agents, it's not cool. they don't hold open houses to like sell the house, right? They're really you're trying to get more buyers and more sellers, and so <clears> they <throat> train most of the agents to sell our house at the open house. And so, I can't tell you how many times where. Someone else is, you know, represented by her comes through, and we're like, okay, and we're selling them the house because the agent doesn't show up. They're just like, want to see the house, and then we're like, great, you're represented, fantastic. We just called the agent up. It's like, what? They're ready to write. Don't screw it up. 
-hmm. Like, they're like, oh, they've been looking for a long time. I was like, no, no, they're ready to write. They're like, don't mess it up. Just call them right now. And, and we take that step to help them do their job, right? And so now it's our house, so we have an incentive. If you're there as an agent, you're just trying to sell more because the way we would reward that is, is okay, well, then we're going to give you another listing somewhere or we're going to give you a bonus. Or we're gonna, because our goal is to sell that house, right? 100%. And so if you have that mindset versus, hey, let's get that buyer to do that, you know, that's just sell the house. And then they're going to remember you, right? You may get a referral, you get a referral from the investor. But the other thing is that if you're just per technique button door knocking, you can find all the pictures you sold and door knocking area, meet that investor and, and kind of form that little area around it, do the same thing for Sunday, which would find three other fixers within walking distance of that house. And he just went with Good job, Jacob. Good job, Jacob. Right. Yeah. And Jacob's just like, whoa, it's my potential lead person. Now mind you, wait, here, this is the important part. Yeah. When did he talk to that house first across the street? I would say about six months ago. About six months ago. When I first started the project. So it's when not like an immediate started. thing. This is like a it, this stuff built up, right? So if you don't have a good CRM or you're not, you're not piped in with it, that's your biggest mistake. Follow up for him right. is so important. CRM is so important. Those alerts are so important. He invited them to our growth with him. And they came to our well, They were, they were at our growth group for that incognito three times. They just kept going back and were in awe over what we've done. I think you should tell a story about like when you door knocked the first time about the Oh, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't good. It was. It was. But the point is, it wasn't good, so, and, and it's still. They're still like. So I call. So I call him because I'm like, you won't believe it just happened to me. This doesn't happen to me. Like no. So I see the one of the wait, wait, owners. Wait, wait, sorry, let me preface this. She's very proper and conservative. Comes from a legal background. Was at a like a law firm where they're just very conservative and very. Uh, Considerate of everyone. Yeah, and, and they're so one thing with me is I'm super considerate of others and whatever you're going through, you guys, the biggest thing you can have is empathy and care for what somebody's going through. And remember what they're going through is not you. It's just that they're going through something. So I approach this car that pulls up and I know it's one of the siblings of the mother that just passed away because the intel was that the ambulance had come and I was like, oh no, like I have to go and give, like number one, check to see if it's, everything's okay. And then if it's not, like how can I be there from a sympathy standpoint, right? So I go up to the car and I'm like, hey, I just wanna let you know, uh, you know, I understand that this happened. Yeah, my mom did pass away. My mom passed away and it's just been really tough. And I said, well, I wanna give you my condolences. I just want you to know that we're here if you guys need anything if it's associated to the house or anything that you need, because we had helped them fix their roof when it was pouring rain, because the lady was up on her roof hammering shingles. So I saw my contractor calls me and said, Jolene, she's up there. I can I go help her? I'm like, yes, go help her. And whatever they need, like I've got the cost, like just help them because it was a section of the garage that they needed support with. So he gets the lady off the ladder so I'm over here like connecting her and saying, just know if you guys need anything, we're here. And next thing you know, she tells me, I don't even understand why I'm talking about something so private. I have nothing else to say to you. And she just flipped on me. And I was like, oh, like, no, no, please understand. That's, you know, my intention isn't, I'm not an ambulance chaser. That's not what I was feeling that way at that moment, like this uncomfortable thing. And I called him, I'm like, Robert, you won't believe what I just did. Like. I made her feel like it was just about the house when that wasn't my intention. Yes, of course, if they want to sell in the future, I mean, but not right now. Mom just passed away. I'm like, they're mourning, right? And what you say? You well, say? Okay, so hang on. I'm going to clarify the timeline <laughs> because the timeline is the best part. It's a big blur. So she's talking to them and she's like, oh, yeah, this is that. And she's like, you know, my guy helped me with the roof. And, you know, are you, you know, if you guys are interested in selling, well, this is before she knew that mom had passed away. Before that. The week before, or like they were, and that was the other yeah. thing. And so she, that's why she got upset. She's like, I don't know why I'm talking to you about all this personal stuff. She's like, my mom just passed away, she, and, and basically told her, like, I think it's really inappropriate that you're like approaching me to buy the house when mom just died like a couple days ago. Yeah. And but she didn't know that at the time, and so she just thought she was having a normal conversation, and that was it. And so the lady was really, really offended, but did show up to the event and did get past that because. She 
apologized. I think every time she saw her, every time from she then saw on, going she was forward, like, I'm so sorry. Like, I really I'm had so no sorry. idea that that happened. And I was like, no, I'm sorry that I made you feel this. But at the end, what happened is this lady comes up to me. I'm sitting in my Porsche, right? The door's open. And I'm waiting for the guys to finish. And mm -hmm. I'm just sitting out there. Of course, you know us, we multitask, right? So the guys are finishing. Somebody's doing something else. I'm on the phone. I'm probably checking emails. I'm doing something. And I see her through the corner of my eye approaching my car. And I'm just like, oh, no, turn right now. Okay. All right, all right, just raise yourself. You don't know who she is today. And you just got to be ready. So she says, hey, Jordan, can I really let you know that my sister and I have decided that we'd like to meet with you to see our house? Thank you so much for being so patient with us. Is it possible that we can see it later on today? By the way, I had a moving truck in front of the house, and we were getting ready to move all the furniture from Spastopol. She's like, can you come back today? And I rushed back from the city of Orange to go and meet her at 4 o'clock that evening. And I said, of course I can. And it was just a totally different person. And here we are, what, two months later after mom's passed away. So you guys, does that happen every time? No, but you just need to be ready because we're in a relationship business. People need us. And the fact that I didn't get to her level, the fact that I never lost respect for her, the fact that I always understood, at the end, they felt my genuineness and they would be so happy to know that, by the way, they are feminist is what they call it. So I said, okay, um, sorry about that. That one wouldn't go to you, it'd come to me because they wanted it to go to a girl. They want a girl to flip it, right? And so they said, we're just about empowering women and to know that you're in an industry, every investor we've met with has been now I'll, I'm going to add to this because I know a lot. I can, I, and that's just them. That you know, a lot of women think that this is a male-dominated, dominated industry, right? And let me just tell you, I, I think that's that women actually part. have an edge in this business. And you know, and and that's. I mean, guys, it's good. Yeah, no, no, but it's okay. <laughs> but it is a mindset, right? But yeah. So you got to just get over that, right? Because it, this is. This business is probably the most equalizing type business. Equalizing. Around, you know, and this is it's, it's very well balanced, but I think women have a slight edge over guys. We'll get to later why he sends me out to do permits for us because he thinks girls <laughs> shouldn't be inspectors. So <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> So what I want to, you know, we're, we're going a little slow because you guys are getting some special stuff here. What the heck? It isn't even on the slide. Uh, yeah, we're on slide one. Yeah, we're on slide one. And so if you don't make three, we'll come back, right? We'll just do another part two. Uh, but where I'm going is, I would love a part two. Yeah, why not, right? You're welcome here whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So purchase history, again, we talked about when I saw it, when, I mean, an agent brought it, I saw the property, I walked it. For us, speed is the name of the game, right? If a seller wants speed, not every seller wants speed. Sometimes sellers are like, whoa, 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 we'll sell it to you, but we need 60 days. Whoa, 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 we'll sell it to you, but we need five days, right? So speed is always going to be a, is it or isn't it? We acclimate ourselves to what a seller needs. And that's the beauty of working. Ask those questions because they're key. Very important. We've both won offers before because everybody else is writing it. 10 day close, 10 day close. And what they're thinking is, how the hell am I going to get all this stuff out of here in 10 days? Yeah. And they have their job or they have whatever else, property they inherited. And now you're freaking them out where you say, hey, you know, we can close yeah, as soon as 15 days or 20 days or with like two extensions because that takes the pressure off. Yeah. And sometimes it's not that. even about money. Then it's like, oh, okay, well, that makes it easier. Maybe they're moving on. There's a lot of circumstances that happen when we're buying this cash, right? So we want you guys to know is that we're open to all timelines and whatever's going to get you the, the transaction, we will work with the sellers to make sure that it is good for them. That's very important. Um, so again, I submitted the offer on the 11th and then the 12th offer was accepted in open escrow. So you see two days, right? Then the 24th, I closed escrow, which was about 12 days. So on average, on that one, they needed a little bit longer because there was an attorney involved. There was a lot of different moving parts. On average, we're closing at about 10 days, sometimes 15, right? Just kind of depends. But we're always open to working with the timelines that you guys need. If you need five days, we got it, right? But that's just kind of a lot. 
Um, now we're going to the sale history. So I bought the property for, it doesn't say on here, but I purchased it for a million 20. Relisted it for 1,398. Sold it for 1,365 in today's market. And then mark days on market 40 days. We know about the Christmas tree house in front, right? Christmas White House. And then rehab cost was originally started at 100. When I went into that house, what immediately happens for my budget? It went to almost 150,000. Why? Because as I was walking through, I decided here's the before photos of me. So I immediately decided I can't leave these restrooms like this. Oh my gosh, the laundry room's in the garage. So I started doing these big ticket items, not knowing what that the market was about to what. Because I was like, blah, 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 I don't listen to the news, I don't listen to negativity, I don't listen to everything. <laughs> yeah, blah, 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 why don't you watch CNN? I don't watch any of that stuff, blah, 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 right? And then, bam, I'm hit with, hi, it's real. So I decided to take a leap of faith and say, yeah, what's another 50? I'm going to get those 50 back. And if I get dollar for dollar, I'm going to make another 100. I'm going to put 50, I'm going to get 100. No problem, right? Well, market shifted. And here are the after pictures. And those are the rest of them. Oh, we only have a few there. But feel free to look her up. Yeah, look her up. And look her up because, because our backyard, if you guys need to go to our girls with her event, you um, missed out. I spoke at that event in the Neon. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. Iris went. Yeah. We have it was the house. Yeah. It, those pictures don't even do it justice. Right. The backyard was right. absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't want to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, care. please look yeah. her up yeah. because the backyard, uh, if you saw the before on the before, was there any of the backyard? Just so you could compare? Mm -hmm. No, no befores. So, um, the, the befores are just, I mean, there were. Weeds all the way up to yeah, but you, you do like the extra stuff, like a screen that comes out the TV, like yeah. you do the special, you go all out. And, and this one, your budget was a hundred thousand initially, and it went to 149 because I decided to do extras. I decided to sell it to, the ship. to yeah. sell it. Well, no, to sell it because I didn't know the ship was coming, so I oh. knew I would make my money double mm -hmm. if I redid the bathrooms, if I moved the laundry. The laundry I was like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna so the make up, the, the upside. Yeah, right? Yes. And so when you look at the shift, right, a million five to end up closing at a million three sixty five. No, it was a million four originally. A million four was the upside. Oh, one three five. Good. So one three. Uh, we always talk about our deals, right? So one three five was the standard, right? One three four was the upside, right. and then anything above that that I could do extra might take me to one three one one four one four two five. So I thought if I got it for a million twenty guys, why wouldn't I do the bathrooms and why wouldn't I do the laundry? Because a different clientele. You know, you're, yeah, you're, you're in the million dollar. You're in the million dollar neighborhoods, right? So mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you appeal to them. You've got this beautiful backyard. Well, what ended up happening is it ended up going into escrow at one three seven five. Took forty days to sell because of the house in front of me. If not, I would have sold it within, within that first weekend. And it's only appraised for 1365. You know, Robert, I don't we don't get appraisal reductions. It just doesn't happen because we put in enough bump to these properties that appraisers like, don't want to leave our houses. They're like, this home is gorgeous. Like they really don't want to leave. And so at the end, it appraised only for um, we went into SRA 1375. And it only appraised for 1355 guys. And we ended up agreeing with the buyers at 1365. They paid 10,000 over asking. When you in the middle. We met in the middle. And I thought that was the most fair thing to do. You'll get to know and see that about us. It's that we're always fair. We want to make transactions happen and we're going to make them work. I know the questions have to be explained, but now that you have a house across the street that now it, do you think is going to bring the, the shifting about um, market? Do you even have that problem that you had with this one as far as selling? No, I think that I have my beautiful home directly in front of her, that that's going to help this other one sell. And so I feel and now you're buying the other one. Now I'm buying the other one. Well, mm -hmm. we're making a decision tomorrow. Okay. But, but different values. Right? Different, yeah. values. Different, right. values. different values. Different right. values. Yeah. Because when I bought this home at a million twenty, 
Yeah, this was a hot market. This was February. So this is a hot market. So, so just look at like the marketplace, right? So a lot of people like they're afraid. So I'm going to ask this, and you asked this early on, if you guys are still buying. And you know the answer is yes, because what happens is once the shift happens, the shift is happening, right? And so there's a lot of people that will wait. But if you're actively involved in the business, you feel that shift, and then you'll have some projects that you either lose a little bit of money, break even on, and, or don't make what you had anticipated on making. But the new ones that you're purchasing are now at a, a different basis. And so you're going to sell those lower. So if you know the, the name of the game is usually like get in and get out. And it, what people don't realize is that every year, like there's a in fact there's a chart for this uh, coming up, but there's a um, there's a shift every single year. Anyway, the last two years have been the exception to that, where it was just constantly going up, going up, going up. Just you so know? slight, you don't really notice. Right. Typically, right. But you hear like the numbers where it's like, hey, there's eight percent appreciation year over year. In a normal market, you might have three, four, five percent appreciation. You know, two percent is actually considered a healthy market. You know, four percent is already getting to that unhealthy level. So you can imagine when we got to sixteen percent, just how you know really unhealthy that was. And so you know, we always wanted to slow down because the ride goes long. You know, and so you'd rather have a longer, even keeled kind of ride than. This up and down. Now, don't get what's wrong, right? The last two years were phenomenal, right? And so, you know, you take a little pain for three months and then it's another ride for however long, so it's fine. But you sit there and you look at um, every year, every year the market, you know, it kind of increases going to spring, peaks at spring into summer, and then falls off a little bit during fall and winter. And so, when you look at those year over year numbers, it goes kind of like this it peaks. And then drop. So, so you might see a peak over like four months that might be a spike. So when on a normal year, let's say it was it ends up being four year, four percent year over year, that spike during those spring months might be six percent, right? And you get back a couple percent during the fall and winter months. And so when you're flipping, you have to know that timing because you're flipping in a four to like six month time frame. So if you buy high and sell low, it's not a great scenario. So you have to be cognizant of what's Happening in the marketplace, and this year it happened much more aggressively than normal. And something that I had never experienced personally myself, right? Because I was in, I was a newer flipper, right? So seeing this and being able to get through it, we're living through it now. I mean, I've seen it now. Um, is my thing is you guys always be conservative, and when it's <clears> when you're at that moment, and I'm excited to go over whenever you have a scenario that you're like, Jeremy, can I flip this property? Please call me with those words. Sophia and I have had great dialogue on can can this be a flip? How do I get my agents to find flips? Giving them that opportunity. I didn't tell her we're doing 10 in the next 12 months. Hundred percent. And so think about mm -hmm. this. That conversation to have that. Sophia's been a dear friend of mine for many years. So to see, I want you guys to know that you can do this too. And if not, you then feel good. My, my new little favorite, I say it all the time to myself in the mirror. If not you, then you. Right? So don't hold yourself back and don't think that you're not enough or you don't know enough or this. You guys are going to have our number. We are super accessible and we love helping you succeed because, like that shirt says, it's the best thing to see when I'm like staring at you. No one succeeds alone. No one succeeds alone. And everything him and I have ever done have been because we've had amazing teams with us and we've had each other. I mean, so many cool things have happened and really gone beyond the expectation because we really believe that no one succeeds alone. And that's what I love about KW is that <coughs> they're real, that mantra, that's what they live by. It's, it's, it's everybody wins. It's not just I win, everybody wins. So going into. Definitely not so much. I mean, we went through 150 and then we have comparables. So he talked about how the comparables change, right? Because then all of a sudden I'm getting ready to list her and the market just shifted. I'm like, what the heck? But guess what I did? Because, you know, I, I'm like, I got this. I can put her out there and she's going to sell. Well, did you know when I put her on the market at 1398, which was our original number was 135 to 14? 
Nobody complained about the price. All they did was complain about what? The house across the street. Over and over. Over and over and over. And over. I never imagine that. But, we, but you know, in, in a very hot market, when there's what less inventory and you don't have choices, it's like they, they wouldn't care about the Who cares, market, right? Yep. But when, the market should be care about the ugly duckling. Right. Exactly. That's and buyers are pickier. That's buyers are pickier. And buyers are going to say what they want. I found I found three flips off of a post. You guys could copy it. And yes. I, and on your social media, I put, um, I I have I'm looking for ugly buyers to buy my ugly houses. And then, or do you have an ugly house for an ugly buyer? And I got so many leads from that. Love that. Like yeah, you know, just yeah. just do funny, be creative, and people in your network probably have you know you are, you attract what you speak about. So just say, who do you know that has a house that needs a lot of repairs and doesn't have many to fix that needs to sell? Like. Sometimes people don't associate um, who, do you, who do you know that wants to sell a home? Because people, when they see their friends struggling, they don't think, oh, my friend has to stop. They just think, oh, my friend's struggling. They can't fix it. They need to move. Like, they don't associate the word selling. Right. So I just say, introduce me to people that have homes that they can't keep up with the repairs. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how I found a couple. That's yeah. amazing. And again, you guys, it's just shifting how you think on yourself. Language, language is important. It's what you attract that you ask for. Language is super important. So we're we're almost there, guys. Let's see. So now we're at the uh, really like the acquisition analysis and then the actual cost. So you're seeing here what I bought it for uh, 120. It ended up being not 135. So this was during the the Girl Flipper event, right? Yeah. Which adjusted to almost 150 when my accountant told me, "Guess how much you spent?" <laughs> and I was like, "Trish, I already know. It's about 135, 138." No, you're almost at 150. I was like, "What?" So she's like, I know we need to get better at that. So my own bookkeeper is helping me to be more accountable to how much I'm spending on these larger projects. She's really tracking everything every week now to tell me how I'm doing because I want to get better. That's his favorite thing is, so how much did you spend? He loves asking that question. I like saying on budget. And we're going to slide <laughs> So estimated numbers are used when trying to determine if it's a good idea to invest in the property while imagining the property's potential to bring good return on the investment. Can you talk a little bit more on that, on like how the estimated numbers versus sure. actual numbers? So we have I'm like a big fan of when you're walking through a project to do a full scope of work, right? And so I go through and the way I structure the scope of work is, is basically we just go and we, we look at everything that the house needs as a whole. And then we break it down by room. And so let's say we're going to paint the whole house on the inside. We're going to paint the whole house on the outside. We're going to, you know, it's going to get landscaping throughout the whole house. I break that down and I also break it down to like, let's say, even the landscaping in the front of the home versus the rear mm -hmm. of the home. And then we start walking through the house. Okay, in the foyer, this is what's going to go on here. And so, okay, we're going to change that light picture. Here's the light picture we're going to use. Here's the light switch that's going to be used. Is it a dimmer, a non dimmer? You know, and then you go through the entire house. We count how many doorknobs are privacy, how many are not private, and so forth. So we go through and just create an entire itemized list. Now, I, I do that for two different reasons. One, this is part of the process to just go through so you have an accurate bid as to what you're going to do, do to the house. The reason she changed here so, so much from 100 to 150 isn't so much that she went, you know, at that much over budget, it's that she changed her scope of work, right, and didn't necessarily update, like, what the if you see the ARB, it updated into a slightly higher price from the, the uh, it did. what was it, a million, yeah. a million three five to a million fifty. So, you know, in, in this case here, if you're looking at it in hindsight, you may have said, okay, well, why spend an extra fifty to just sell it for an extra fifty? You probably would have done that, right? And went back, you know, but she was thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to spend thirty five. There's upside, you know, one. and she got to to she spent another spending fifty. Even then. You, it, it's kind of a tweener to whether maybe looking back if we would have done that that decision, right? And so by going into it at that time, the market's super hot, getting hotter. You can only make the decision for what you have, the information that you have at hand at that time, right? And so you can't beat yourself up after the fact because it's like, oh, you just, just change, change yourself that's it, you move on, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, and so, but I do the scope of work that way, and then I go into the living room, here's what's going to go on, bedroom, bathroom. Bathrooms are obviously key. It's like this is the tile, this is where the tile goes, 
there's a floor tile, there's, there's an exit wall. Um, but I do all that, not just so that I know my cost of materials, but also because I get a lot less questions throughout the process. When you, when you get by the crews that go and do the work, by the contractor, there's many, you know, otherwise they're going to call you and ask you, it's like, hey, how do you want the floor laid? Or worse, they're going to lay it wrong. Right? Yeah, you know, funny. the flooring, you know, even with like laminate flooring or whatever it is that they sit there and they, they put it in. Okay, this is the length of the room, which is what usually looks better. You can't tell you how many times if you don't tell them, they'll rent this one. Right? And then you're you like, you know like this. Yes, that right. makes me proud. Thank yeah. you. And so all horizontal, not vertical. Right. I mean, wait, vertical, not horizontal. Okay. So if you are a quarter view, you want the property. Yeah. <laughs> and so I put all of this into the scope of work so that I don't get those questions throughout the process. Right. So now if you have fast forward and you have you know X amount of projects going, you know, imagine getting 30 calls because hey, I got a call for this, or hey, how does this pile go? You know, it's already look at the sheet. And so the smart contractors have that and they have it there in the house of so all we their print workers, it out for them and it's at right. the house, so it's always the same. And, and so they know, you know, the best guys. They take off the section where the bedroom, bedroom number one, just post it. And so that they have, they know exactly what. So if there's a lull in something or they're waiting for some of the guys to get material, they have it and there's other things there that they can be doing, then they could be advancing that other stuff. And so I, I um, it helps me kind of, I, I think, stay on budget more so. But also what happens is that my upfront numbers tend to be higher because I'm accounting for all of these things. Like, and when, I'm, when I'm lending money, what happens is this: is I get a lot of clients. They come in and might say, "Oh, I'm going to spend, you know, forty-five thousand fixing this, this fifteen hundred square foot house." I'm like, "Okay, what are you going to do it?" It's like, "Oh, we're going to put a new kitchen, do this." I'm like, "All right, that's like forty thousand materials, you know." And what they're really saying is, "I haven't really done my numbers," or you know, they're just basically telling me a low number because they want to come in and talk money, right? So the problem is when you're a lender. Is I don't want to enable you to fail, right? So what I want to do is I want to sit there and make sure that you have all of the money to do the deal and to be successful doing the deal. And so part of that is analyzing your scenario, analyzing the property. And if you have a relationship with a lender, it may be where I say, hey, you know what? I'm going to lend you more money because I don't want you to get stuck. You know, and when you're looking at that, if you sit there and you're so concerned about one thing. You may miss out on that other part of the relationship, but you also might screw yourself, right? If you're sitting there saying, oh, no, I've got 100, like, well, with payments, with floating the construction, you, you don't have enough money to do it. Awesome. And these are all things that we're going to guide you guys on. So just know that when you call us and you're ready and you want us to work out a deal, we're going to analyze it and we're going to come up with all these scenarios that could happen because we want you guys to succeed. That's one premise for him all the time. Whenever I brought a deal and I was analyzing it, and I was young in the business, is he'd be like, Jeremy, I don't want you to fail. Like, we've been through enough. We want to make sure that we can help each other win, right? So sometimes you're going to have to walk away from deals. You're like, gosh, I wish this could work. But the one thing that we're super transparent on is scope of work, is budgets, is knowing dollar for dollar. Are you, how much can you get you to make? Because at the end, we want you to be profitable so you can get excited for the next one. And the next one, and then now you built another lane for yourself where now you can start tracking this and start making the passion. And the other thing I want to touch on is you don't need to be amazing at everything that has to do with flip. So he and I talk about this gosh, your eye of design, your eye of this, your eye of that. If you can just find I don't, I don't even have pictures up at my own house, okay? And I see, I see, <laughs> we said we're gonna go visit yeah. one day and just yeah. transform the house. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 their houses are just so like. Model homes. Don't we say we can go to our house one day? And yeah, one day. I don't even have pictures of you know, like so. I'm like definitely not going to. We're going to do extreme makeover one day. <laughs> Bam! Here she is. Yeah. So where I'm going is that you guys, you don't need to know all this to find that first whip. When you find it, you're going to have us. Um, Aurora asked me a good question. She said, "Okay, so if I find the deal, I can represent the seller and the buyer, so they can double in and do a come in and buy it for me." Yes. The answer is yes. Yes. Well, we are your new buyer. We are your new buyer. We are here, and you always represent us. That's we want to make sure that you win. And at the end, like I said, if the budget works and the numbers work, we can get you to relist the property as well. If we can make the numbers work. 
Sometimes the numbers are a little too tight for us to be able to do that, and it makes it tough. But our end goal is always that for sure you represent us on buying it and missing it. Yeah. And then permits and inspections, of course, he always sends me. And why? Because go rock when it comes to dealing with mail inspectors. <laughs> As a last resort, you can send me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And he'll be like, no. And then when I walk, when I'm walking out of the house, my fiance, he'll say, Where are you going? Is there a club going on during the day? Or what? And I'm like, go in for it, you've got to pass inspection. <laughs> Inspectors life is too hard on them. You know, he turns on the whole house music system. And what did you have? What's that guy, Barry White? Did you have Barry White going on when the inspector at Pedro said, What did he tell you? About so we get married. This so is real. Right. This I is real. So, in all fairness, we knew ahead of time that this inspector liked working with. We emails, did some homework. Right? We did some homework. And, <laughs> and, you know, this house had, like, it, it has, it has its issues because. It was in the Coastal Commission and so forth. So there's certain things that, you know, we kind of did to the house that we did and then asked for forgiveness instead of going through the whole series. Because the, the pro, like understanding the process, if you went through the whole process, it may have been a year. During the pandemic. Year, yeah. During the pandemic, right. It may have been a year, year and a half to get that approval. Whereas if you did it, it's like, then they fast track it. But you have to, you might have to do, you have to gamble with, you might have, it might make you do more work. Than what you originally intended, but we knew that the inspector was a friendly guy. And friendly. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm like, you're going to go to the inspection. Okay, so I'm not going to go to the inspection. You're going to go to the inspection. And then we always put whole house music systems in our homes, right? So he arrives early. We found out, we, yeah, we found out the guy's age and his demographic. So we had music playing in the right? So, so by the way, yeah. this is the same thing that we open the house with. No, listen, for the open houses, it's the same thing. We do the homework on the buyers that have bought other homes in the area and check the demographics. So who's the primary demographic that we're doing that home towards? And then we play music that is that will help them connect that demographic. So he knew with the guy kind of his genre, right? So he puts on what he what song was that? It wasn't very wild, but that would have been awesome. So it was, it was one of those, and, and the guy's like, yeah, Robert, so could you step out of the room? I want to walk the inspection with her. And, and I'm like, out and here. straight out to him. And I look at Robert, and I'm like, yes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, we passed it. He's now our friend. And he's he, your friend. <laughs> <laughs> he does not have my number. <laughs> And anything in the county of LA, I died. Because you know what? It just works that way. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. You work in LA. You work in San Diego, too. So we haven't done, I mean, we've done a couple. Uh, yeah, I got We've done a couple. San Diego, I, I like um, San Diego. We have like one contractor out there that handles the stuff. Um, so if you should do the Send them over answer, because we're analyzing we're be everything now. And so you may expand this into that market. We derive like more of our stuff has been in OC in LA County and a little bit of the Illinois part. But we're always looking. I mean, he's looking at one right now in Moreno Valley that we were talking about last night. And we thought, huh, mobile, okay, cool, let's do this. And so we're always open to different areas that maybe we can put So I think the key part about this section here is that a lot of investors don't pull permits for their job, right? They just do them, they do the work, and they do whatever. And I've always kind of tried to instill in her that, you know, listen, you can't build a legitimate business on an illegitimate practice, right? Just full permit. It's not a big deal, right? And you're better off knowing that everything's happening and being done correctly. You know, and it, it, at the end of the project, it really costs you maybe a week or two, you know, in two weeks if you're failing like, along the way. One week if you're just passing the inspections by long. And buyers love it too. When you're presenting a home and it's all permitted, I mean, you just feel good about that, you know? And it, yeah, it is adding times. It is, it is adding to your timeline. Um, but I think the better relationships you build with your city inspectors and with your different cities, they start to know and they start to see the quality of your work. So they don't go in with the mindset as these guys are trying to do shoddy work. They go in with the mindset of knowing the quality of our work and that we care. 
And so that's what I want to build over time is those relationships. Now, with the senior staff. Yeah. The other thing is that when you're doing this process, let's say you're just new to the business or you're meeting with investors, try to be there for the investors. Yeah. Because you learn the most there. Yeah. So because what let me let me give you one that just happened with us. I, I walked one of our projects in Culver City, and I told I told the guy, I'm like, you're gonna fail today. And he's like, why? And they, I'm like, your plumbing's off here. And he's like, no, let's see what he says. Like, okay. And he walks through, and I didn't know the reason. Like I knew it was like he set this trap too low, and I didn't know the reason behind it. I just knew that like you have to be six inches low. off the ground with the like. But the reason is the inspector sat there and explained the reason. I'm like, oh, now I told you get it. And it was it was the fall rate for what the fall rate is like when the water goes in for the like your let's say your clothes washer and it's up higher. And if it's so if it's more than 18 inches from where it enters to where the trap is, the trap is that part that you've probably seen underneath your sink where it's kind of an S, right? And so most people think that the trap is there to trap if you drop something in. It's there to actually trap water, right? And the reason it traps water. Is that if you don't have that trap there, the smell of the sewer, so the smell of sewer goes up, yeah. right? And so if it falls too quickly, it's going to push all the water out, and then it lets the gases come in from the sewer. Mm -hmm. And so his was set too low, it's down at like the floor level, and he's like, "You're too, you're, you're off." So he was as much as like he was over, he was almost thirty inches off, and you know, but the max is eighteen inches, and so I just knew it was too low. I didn't really know the thought process behind it, but that inspection taught me that, right? And so I don't teach you to do that. It's, it's, it is, it is uh, uh, but knowing that stuff so that when you're walking through a project, you know, and you smell something, you'll know like, oh, this might be set wrong, really easy fix, right? But if you don't know, you might think it's something much more major. And so having that expertise or that knowledge is really going to help you going through and, and looking at these pictures because then you start looking at it like we look at it. Right, we don't look at all the junk, we look beyond the junk at what we can save. Because even the houses that are in pretty good shape, we're gonna tear everything out anyway. So we're gonna screw that house up. Right. So whether it was up ahead a bunch of like messed up cabinets, it doesn't matter. We're gonna tear that out anyway. Who cares? So look yeah. beyond that for what you're actually getting. Yeah. And that's what we've kind of just been years. You walk through and it's like, oh great, we're gonna great. And sometimes you'll find yourself in a rare situation where like that Christmas lighthouse directly in front. She, I'm at her front porch and she goes, well, I'm just preparing you this really bad in there. There's exposed wiring, there's this, there's a lot of cats, there's four families living here. It's really bad. And I said, no problem, I understand. And this is what I work with. And I go, can we really say that it needs new floors, new kitchen, new AC, new electrical, new common, new roof? And she's like, yes. I go, it's okay, I don't need to go if, if I make an offer, I'm going to have a five day inspection period on it. Then I'll, and you guys accept it, then I'll do that. You should have seen the sense of your viewpoint. She respected the fact that I respected her for the panic she was in of the fact that I was going to go in. So I said, I'm going to assume the worst about everything, and the only thing that I don't know about is your foundation. So he just, I mean, her sense of beauty profit was like, she just, like her color came back. And I said, when this works and we come together with a good number, then I'll lock it and go to a full inspection. That's a great example of a seller who is embarrassed about their living scenario mm -hmm. and yeah. probably should have sold this house years ago, mm -hmm. but had been embarrassed about doing that going forward or dealing with it. And so now she's at the point for whatever reason she wants to sell it, likely because she's like, wow, I can get another dollars for this now, mm -hmm. right? Or whatever number, right? That she's thinking in her head. Now it's like the timing was good for her, where she never thought maybe that house would be worth that much value. She never she thought could I out. could sell. And one thing she said about all the neighbors said, she will never sell that house more than one point three million. But I don't know what she's thinking. And I sold it for one three six five, actually one three seven five. It appraised for one three five. Everybody right now, imagine what they're thinking about her. They're just like this girl's no shit. This is it, right? Because again, we study the numbers, we study it, we take our time. There is no rushing into a deal because we want to make the deal work. It's analyzing all the little pitfalls of things that could happen. Going back to 
that door knocking thing that a lot of you guys do know about, right? If yeah, you find, if you find these clips that have already sold and sold for a high number, that same thought process happens with other neighbors around other homes, right? Because that's the consumer mindset. So those that's a marketing campaign for you to sit there and go and do when you're door knocking. It's like, look, this house is sold for this much. Yours can too, right? And and you haven't touched on which I think you should probably be uh, the uh, put your own home portion. Oh yeah, and so through this journey, what's happened is sometimes sellers say, "Darling, you respect me," and the agent, your number's too low. And I'll see a home that's inherited. What do you guys think that I'm thinking when I'm sitting in the hot seat with the seller and the agent? I'm like, I could just get a hold of this house. What I would do, with it, right? So what I did is there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Combs who said, "Darling, my home is on the market for a year." I don't even know what to do, but sell it cash because it, I, we got no offers. What came out of my heart at that moment is I said, why don't I help you fix it so we can put it on the market and you can make money? He didn't understand what that meant or how it would work. And this man had six four beds in his garage. Dr. Collins is a very affluent client in an area called the Carriage Estates in Ranch Virginia. So what I did is I went and I took about $20,000 and I said, you're going to pay the contractors directly, not knowing what I was creating at that moment. And we're going to help you flip your house so we can get you and your wife to call us. That home was in escrow within two weeks after I did what I did. And he, in 45 days, I was in the house. So what that inspired me to do is create a company by the name of Turney. And term leaf is we fix it before you list it. So if the numbers don't make sense for us to buy it cash, what we'll do is we'll run a full analysis of how can we flip it for the seller and then you in turn list that house once we're done with the renovation. And this tends to work with homes that are already vacant, that are inherited homes. Mom maybe is aging out and she's moving with family. There's a lot of different scenarios where we see that flip your own house is going to be perfect for that. And what term leaf is, is we're going to handle A to Z. If the house needs to be junk haul, a lot of junk haul, it needs to be, a lot of stuff needs to be removed, we're going to handle it. Estate sale, we're going to handle it. We're going to get that property ready so we can come in and we can make her beautiful. Then we're going to stage her. And then what's going to happen, you guys are going to get professional photography done, and you're going to put her on the market. What do you think the sellers are going to say about the Wow. So what we've done, and we've done this off and on over the course of the last three years to see how it goes, because we had to meet with real estate attorneys to develop our contracts, to develop everything. So it's done all through escrow and we work with their money or our money. So if they don't have the money, we put the money. If they have the, if, uh, if they don't, if they do have the money, then we work with their money. And the profit share is this, you guys will tell us how much the home is worth as is. Whatever additional equity we build with what the work we're doing, that's what we split with the home. So if we're putting the money, we split it 50-50. If they're putting the money, we charge 35%, which on average is what a contractor charges in the retail space. So we're charging an additional 5% for the interior design concept, the staging, and all the pluses of having a design team involved. Because contractors, what do they do? All they say is, what? Well, give me a list of what you want to do. And I don't care if it looks like I'm going to do it. We've seen some really bad farm scenes go in, and then all of a sudden, you know, what's happening? Well, they put the wrong cabinetry in. And it was how, how simple of a mistake, right. right? But where I'm going is that turn is really the direction of you want everybody to do. So talk about the numbers on Maryland, because that was a turn. That was a turn. So, Maryland, I'm going to give you the quickest scenario so you can get to Robert is this. Turnley Field um, inherits the home from her aunt in the city of Glendale. Doesn't know what to do with it because her aunt was a hoarder. One of my team members is walking her dog and sees the lady watering her grass and says, you know, they're talking about a low quad tree. And the lady says, I don't know what I'm going to do. My aunt left me this house and I don't know where to start because she was a hoarder. 
then this house behind that door, you can't even walk through because it's filled with snow. So my team member on the Girl Flipper team says, you know, there's a chance that we can help. We can now hire cash or we can help you fix it before you list it. Well, you need to remember that for this lady, this was the only asset she will ever see. And this is the only amount of money she'll ever see before she can now turn around and invest in other things. So she had to squeeze every dollar out of this home versus selling the cash. We went in and we put approximately and boy, based on memory, about 135,000 rehab. Remember, she was not living in the home. She had inherited the home. I sent my contract to her probate attorney for review. So he could approve it before we went into contract. He loved the concept. And now I'm like at the top of his list for his clients. We ended up turning that house and getting it for as his value at that time was in the 900s. Well, what happened is the market shifted to the what? Skyrocketing. So next thing you know, we put 130,000. We thought that she was going to sell for 1.2, 1.3. We ended up selling for 1.575. And wait, and that was not We got offers all the way up to 1.7. The lady either wanted to sell her house because it was important to her that this house went to the family. But she took a hundred and something thousand dollars less, less, right? Because the mom was buying it as a wedding present for her son. Oh. And she's like, that's me. I'm like, really? Because <laughs> we're splitting profit, right? Because like, <laughs> 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 we're splitting profit. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm, and, and actually, um, you know, cutting the, the, the profit a little bit because uh -huh. it, it's it's so outperformed, right? That it's not necessarily everything, like, what we did had a lot to do with it, hundred percent. Right, yeah. but the market had a lot to do with it as well. It just skyrocketed. She mentioned she's at the top of this attorney list. The reason is, you know, the attorney's looking at how much you're making, and you're already making a good amount now because the market took off, and we did our every perform all along the way. But what happens is this: is now she, he's, she's like, you know what? That's too much money. I'm going to lower it because your client is part of it as if, and that type of integrity. Let that client know, like, oh, I'm going to refer her more clients. Mm -hmm. So that little give is going to get her many, many more like referrals. So, so we're coming to an end. I just want to make sure that they know how to contact you and like, yeah, like how do they? Is there a number? Your email? Yes, yes, yes. Information. And so the website for Trinley is TrinleyFrenovations.com. It's right now. It's in infant stages. I'm getting that website, you know, revamped and getting it moving along. But it is TrinleyFrenovations.com, and maybe we'll have a part two. Uh, yes, you have black expo oh, yes, yes. Yeah, the black expo ones are the biggest. Thank you. I appreciate it. Girl flipper. Girl flipper. Girl flipper. Girl flipper. Yeah, she has her brand. <laughs> don't, don't let the word girl fool you. She's a bad <laughs> <laughs> woman. And Mr. Fergoso wow. over here, I want to touch on you guys. Are you, are you boy flipper? He's boy flipper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. This is not the same. Boy flipper? It, does, it doesn't, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Can I have a, um, ask a question? Oh, questions. Yes. 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 Yeah, please. You guys, you have pizza. Barbara's going to speak right now. She's our sponsor and she's here. After they're done, we can get the information and then we can get some food. And you ask a couple questions. Yeah, have, the, the question I'm, I'm going to ask, I don't know if it's a dumb question or not, but how do you guys offer, what do you guys offer? Where is your offering price to the seller? Um, is it like open door kind of scenario that they just throw numbers? I mean, where do you guys get this from? The, the offer that you guys send out? They have to take a certain percentage. Uh, open door lost 30 some odd million, so we tried out tonight. No, no, I'm saying, no, they just, you know, catch traffic. Um, no, no. So, um, was it again? Yeah, I was looking for it. I think that's one of the big issues for that. But, well, you're uh, answering me right now. Yeah. Sure. I thought I knew it by heart. I should. So. All right. So to answer your question. Um, we basically do all of the numbers on the, 
Sorry. And also, I mean, my idea and everything was on uh, the yeah, it's if on you the, take a picture of this QR code. There, I, I tagged it on the KW Lakes uh, Instagram page. Yeah. They're posted on there too. Um, your story, KW the Lakes, follow us on our Instagram, okay? All but basically, so is that big <laughs> enough for you guys to get? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so what we basically do is this, just the process that we just kind of described, right? We go through the house, we look at the assets and variables, we look at, we do a full scope of work. And when we're just looking at the property, make an offer, we just kind of guess that. What it is, but before we close, we'll have a full scope of work. Um, based on experience, we'll just say, okay, this house needs X amount of dollars. We'll plug that in. And then we're looking for right now, probably a, you know, like more like a 12% net to sales profit margin. As much as the 15 percent and so what that means is that when i say net to sales it's net to the after repair value so if the after repair value is let's say million dollars we expect there to be a hundred thousand dollars net and then a profit there, uh, in that deal um, and if, that's what you split if, if we're looking right if we're, if, if we're leveraging that transaction unleveraged if we're just paying cash then it's a uh, probably somewhere about a 15 to 18 percent margin right now so if you didn't want to, you know, you'd like and that's how I started. By the way, yeah. I started that way, but just kind of bringing the money to that first deal. Not sometimes just bringing the deal, getting the listing back. It really was creative ways on how can I just have my foot in the space, right? So I never took it like, oh well, how about me or I need more or this. It was always like, how can I just have my foot in the space? Because what happens when your foot's in the space? That opens up other opportunities when you start to get even more transactions going in that space. So it's always understand that just be creative on how can you make sure everybody wins so that we don't lose that. Deal, and, don't and, lose that and this is a good intro for a lot of you to get into other neighborhoods that maybe you want to increase the price points that you're at or whatever it is. Because, you know, for us, it's the same amount of work really to flip a $400,000 house as it is a million dollar house. You know? And so, if you'd rather kind of like get your foot into the door in a different neighborhood, perhaps this is a good entry. A question, yes. quick, and I had it earlier too, before yes. I forget. It goes off of what Lorena was kind of asking where your ugly house, so your beautiful, you know, updated home, yes. you already made an offer. So can you give us an idea of what you're offering on the ugly house? Because now you bought one for a million twenty. And how much are you offering over here based on the market shift? What is that? Look I'm like? going to be about 800 to 850. Oh, okay. it's going to be able to sell the range around it. Yeah. Now That's you fine. remember with this house, it's a smaller lot, same size. Model. No pool. No pool. No more work. More work. <laughs> a lot more work. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm in the 800 to 850. I'm still running the analysis tonight, a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be personally presenting that offer to her tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. Right. So Wait, 50. So then what are you looking to sell? So store? what is my after repair value? Yeah. That's something, too. You guys, I just came back from an extensive birthday month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was her thing? She celebrated all month. Yeah. So that's how we do it. That's right. So, see? And you know, my honey, honey's, my honey's like, please get to the 27th, 28th of September because I still have <laughs> another another dinner this weekend with friends. So, Aww. so where I'm going is, you guys, I should know my ARV by now, but I won't know until tonight because okay. I just got back on a flight last night. And okay. and I'm here. Oh, so wow. thank you for that. Well, thanks for um, being here. Yeah. And so of course we're also filming on HGTV, you guys, for a show. Oh, <laughs> had to had to throw that out. We're doing our last week of filming. Why not? Right? <laughs> and by the way, they're gonna they might be asking for open house um, guests, so if they do. Um, um, yeah. Yes. Message me and just say, hey, you guys would like to because I'm gonna be I'm gonna find out we're filming again on Thursday. So I think it's gonna be our listing uh, filming. Home is officially staged and ready to go here in the city board. But we are filming on a show called Flip 101 with Tarek. It's gonna be on HGTV. Yeah. We're gonna support and, you on And it's about mm -hmm. saying girls whoever spends too much money. Really, that is the premise. <laughs> Um, you'll get to know a little bit about my honey. He's going to be on the show as the guy who wants to join Girl Flipper, but obviously Girl Flipper spends too much. So he stays on his corporate job. We need to keep him there because I get benefits and it works. Um, but um, the, fun, no, the funny thing is that we do want to bring him onto the family business and we want to build that into, but obviously we need to make sure the company's making enough money to support his income. So the premise of the show you're going to see is about that. And your guys are going to see... Uh, I think it's going to be filmed or it's going to be go live at the end of this year. 
And if not, it's going to go on at the beginning of the new year. But they're going to let me know. So if you guys follow me on IG, I will be putting that on there as to when we're going to be on TV, Joseph and I. And you're going to be seeing an entire renovation project on TV fully with Tarek. And it's going to be um, the Flip 101 series. It's awesome. Congratulations. Again, reach out to either one of us, Robert, any type of money question, anything you need. I mean, this guy, not only money, construction, uh, just any questions. He's a big geek like I am. We love pouring it to others. And if there's anything that maybe is questionable, a questionable deal, a questionable something, feel free to stay in touch with us. Yes. You can do major uh, constructions or your team uh, would work on major kind of building and selling, such uh, similar to KB and stuff. And My largest project is a 56 unit Perfect. Then I will definitely connect to people like us on the Wow, there you go. See? <laughs> this is yeah. Do you have an analysis spreadsheet for? That we can get from you. Yeah, we need a part two. We need a part two. We'll just do a chart part two. We're going to be starting a coaching yeah. program, by the way, you guys. Um, you're going to get Robert and I really coming from different perspectives. He's coming from a construction background. I'm coming from being a newbie and growth for being in you know first five years. So we're going to be building this together to empower you guys to learn from us and to learn. What way you can do okay, it? First student, remember? I yes, and so we have to do it. And so we're building websites right now. We're doing everything, and we'll get you guys involved on that as well, so you guys can be part of our mentorship. Program. Before you walk away, Barbara wants a picture with you from our sponsor. Yes. Hi, Barbara.